thank you. So yes, so while all the other papers are about Britain, um, some parallels have been drawn to Northern Gaul, uh, which is only slightly problematic because we also have a lot of problems in Northern Gaul, so don't base too much of your assumptions on parallels because we're also just figuring it out. Um, so today I'll be talking <coughs> a bit about the fifth century in Belgian archeology. span um, Currently, we're working on exploring the fifth century more with a new colleague of mine who started his PhD research on the early medieval period. But unfortunately, we have just started. Um, so my talk today will be much from a late Roman perspective. Um, so I apologize for that. So most of the data I will show is for rather the first half of the fifth century than the fifth century in general. But the issues that I want to talk about that have contributed to obscuring the fifth century can be applied as a whole. Okay, so first a bit of background for those who have never crossed the channel. Um, <laughs> in 2012 and tw uh, between 2012 and 2016, rather, um, we had a project called the Decline and Fall Project, and this took place mostly in Northern Gaul, the region between the Lower Rhine frontier, the Northern Sea, and the Limes Belgicus that you see the road just going parallel over here. Now today <laughs> I will be focusing uh, mostly on the area of Flanders, which is roughly encircled <coughs> in blue here. And here you see a more detailed map. Um, at the end of our project, uh, I came up with this map of kind of rea reliable late Roman sites and finds, uh, finds rather than just plotting everything that we find on a map. Um, so as you can see from this, the number of sites and finds are pretty few. Um, so we are not disputing that there is uh, no abandonment, no decline. It is, but it has to be put in context because this uh, apparent almost empty landscape is something that had been set in place from the end of the 2nd century onwards. So it's not a new thing for the 4th and 5th century. Okay, so let me dive into this uh, at the issues why we have uh, problems in encountering uh, new late Roman and medieval sites by focusing on a small case study here in the Lys Skelt Valley. Um, in 1992 uh, Vermeule published an inventory of this region, counting a total of 76 confirmed and suspected Roman sites uh, by means of excavation or survey. 25 years later, after two decade, uh, decades of rescue and commercial archaeology, we see that uh, Vermeulen's inventory, um, the, excava the number of excavated sites had doubled to 152. Now, if we go and see what he actually labeled as late Roman, we see there were only three sites in the area. Now, that was 92, now again 2017, we only have added two sites, one in 2014 and one in 2016. Um, a little side note on that, based on the discussion we had earlier, um, this is completely due to the discovery mm. of uh, a house type called Wester, and we have only been made aware of that because Dutch companies have started to work on Flemish excavations, and these Wester type houses are a Dutch typology. So if the Dutch hadn't been working in our area, we wouldn't be aware of this and we would also have missed this. Um, so for almost 25 years, no additional sites dating to the 4th to 5th century would have been found in this area. And this area, unfortunately, is not an isolated case. So after two decades of intensive archaeological fieldwork and thousands of excavation, we are faced with the question, why haven't we found more late Roman sites? Is it because the traditional narrative of abandonment is correct, or are there other factors at play? Now, when we start to take a look, we dive into the res uh, research history and literature uh, from Belgian archaeology, and a few trends become immediately apparent. The first one is, has to do with dating. Uh, most of the time, a soft dating is applied, which means that they either label a site or a find as late Roman, and then they mean it's 4th or 5th century, or they do, it's late Roman or early medieval or late Roman to early medieval, which means it's the 4th to 6th century. So when you look at hundreds of sources, there's only a handful of them that actually give you specific dates. A second observation is the repetition of weak interpretations that are often outdated and contradictory. For instance, at the same time, there's on the one hand an empty landscape assumed for a span of over two centuries because of the mass abandonment as a result of the complete destruction by barbarians, and on the other hand, a landscape that is heavily <coughs> militarized uh, to face this barbarian threat and flooded with Germanic people in the mass migrations. How can the same area be considered empty and flooded with soldiers and immigrants at the same time? 
And what about some of the urban centers like Tongre Urtrne that are historically and archaeologically recorded to thrive in the 4th century? Uh, the former becomes a Christian hotspot in the 5th century and later the birthplace of Merovingian power. So from this literature review, a first conclusion appears that there is a general lack of trying in to get away from the traditional historical narrative or an attempt to look at the archaeological data without preconceived conclusions. Let me illustrate this by two maps uh, made by Brulet in 1990. This was the state of research in 1990 and pretty much in 2012 when we started our project. Um, so at the top left, you see a map of the 4th and 5th century settlements, <coughs> and on the bottom right, you see them of the military installations. And you can see the rest of the landscape. This is Flanders. It's pretty much empty. Uh, only a couple of sites over there. So this is the idea that archaeologists have when they start to work in Roman and early medieval archaeology. Now, how did we come to this point? Is there really that little of a population of 4th and 5th century, or are we missing something? If we take a look at the picture it's presented to us up until the end of the 20th century, it becomes clear that in the tradition of decline and fall school, the barbarians get the blame for the fall of the Roman Empire, either by, the, uh, by barbarian invasions or the infiltration of Germanic culture. By the 80s and 90s, some shift occurred. While the Romanization debate, debate inspired a general change in <coughs> provincial Roman archaeology that led us away from the cultural history uh, discourse, this practice actually increased instead of decreased for the 4th and 5th century archaeology, mapping Germanic ethnicities such as Franks and Saxons. Simultaneously, the rise of the field of late antiquity inspired some sporadic attention towards the rise of Christianity or the first Christians and elite Merovingian culture, such as highly decorated brooches, for instance. But still, there was no real appreciation for late Roman archaeology, that only the mess that is the 5th century. For the Roman era in Northern Gaul, uh, was considered to have ended circa 410, equally to Britain, and the Merovingian only started with Clovis in 480, so leaving about half of the 5th century unaccounted for. In the last decade or so, things have started to change with uh, commercial archaeology. No longer are find new finds dependent on individual scholars investigating their own research agenda, but all encountered archaeological features are excavated, which led to a new problem. Beyond only a handful of markers, none of the actual excavators seem to have a clear idea of what late Roman or early medieval archaeological record looks like. I did the exercise for the late Roman part. Uh, I queried hundreds of literature sources and only found 71 that actually give a reason why they dated to the 4th or 5th century. And um, out of this, only seven criteria are recurrently used. Um, as you can see on this graph, uh, the biggest one is the Argona Semion <coughs> Um is together, these are these three, for accounts for 20%. You have the Eiffelware and coins. Uh, you have sunken hut features, Weister houses. So note that structures and um, settlement features only come at the fourth and fifth place. Um, and we also have late Roman terra nigra foot vessels and some radiocarbon dates making only up about 7% of the cases. So these seven markers make up more than three quarters of how we date late Roman archaeology, 4th and 5th century. Um, yet it is known that handmade pottery, for instance, is the most frequent ceramic group to be found on rural settlements for the 4th to 6th century in this <coughs> area. It is only applied in 7% of the cases. Furthermore, if it has no exotic inclusions, uh, like you can see here, the big white rocks, or is, isn't found in an assemblage together with the Samian, the Eiffel, or the Terra Nigra where it often remains unidentified or is placed in the late Iron Age. So, we can get into the question, who's to blame? Um, how do we get to this sad state of affairs? Well, first, we can also always go back and blame it on, uh, on Gibbon and consider the influence that his work still has on late Roman archaeology today, as is nicely illustrated by the quote here um, on the description of the catastrophic view by Ward, Ward Perkins, in which he says that a high point in human achievement, the civilization of Greece and Rome, was destroyed in the West by hostile invasions called, quite simply, the barbarians. These barbarians crossed into the empire through the Rhine and Danube frontiers, beginning a process that was to lead to dissolution not only of the Roman political structure, but also of the Roman way of life. Uh, pretty bleak, if you ask me. So we can move on and um, go into what James has been talking about, and we can blame the practice of periodization. Uh, <coughs> As such, periodization is a type of classification in which periods are artificial chronological classes with a start, middle, and end. Traditionally, most studies are first interested in the middle, 
which is the height of a specific society or culture, and what we most frequently en encounter in the archaeological record. Secondly, uh, usually the start is being investigated uh, because it's the run up to the height. It's the origin story, if you will. The end is always, almost always portrayed as a decline and is often found to be decadent, messy, and rather uninteresting in comparison to the previous phases, of course. So the fifth century is particularly troubling because it's not really an ending, because Northern Gaul um, had the withdrawal of the Roman forces that marked the end of the, uh, the Roman historical period at 410, <coughs> And the Merovingian period only starts at 480, so it, it's also not really a beginning, which means that the bulk of the 5th century has gone missing. Fallen between the cracks of Roman and Merovingian history, making it as an in-between phase, which does not really belong on either plate of Roman or medieval archaeologists. A third factor that I need to mention and has been discussed already um, a lot, so I'll be brief about this, is the persistence of the ethnic discourse with the application of a normative concept of culture and an uncritical use of written sources, resulting in studies that are interested in mapping tribes by specific artifacts and link these with historically attested migrations. Furthermore, it created dichotomies such as Roman versus Barbarian, Christian versus Pagan, and so on, which are more often applied to consider the Roman legal status of German, uh, Germanic immigrants rather than to consider the real complexity of these migrations and their impact on Roman society. Now, I think I might have a scoop with this one, because usually this issue is not brought forth when discussing the 5th century. Um, and the observation is quite simple. The Romanization debate got lost in the 3rd century crisis. Um, since the start of this debate, attention in provincial Roman archaeology has turned to matters of local and regional agencies to search for empirical data to understand the observed changes in the material record. In short, uh, this is lacking for the late Roman period and perhaps for much of late antiquity in general. Biases from 19th and early 20th century are allowed to persist, near cultural historical methods are being applied by focusing on ethnicity and mapping tribe migrations based on material culture, discussing whether a settlement is Roman or Germanic as if it can't be both or something different altogether. They are largely ignoring the current globalization, hybridization debates and relying uncritically on sparse historic documentation rather than working on innovative uh, methods to deal with the existence of a knowledge gap or taking a hard look at why little to no progress has been made over the past half century. So in general, the 5th century in Northern Gaul is a mess. It lacks identity. It's not fully Roman, Gallo-Roman, Germanic, Frankish or Christian. It simply does not fit in a box and could use a movement similar to the Romanization debate to spark new avenues of research. Which brings me to my fifth point, uh, that late antique archaeology forgets that there is more than trees in a forest. Um, although late antiquity offers us the benefits of a long durée approach and a more positive influence of transformation, it focuses mainly on the Roman East, rise of Byzantium, rise of Christianity, and so on. Again, in studies on Gaul, <coughs> I'm seeing more interest in elite material culture rather than local or regional dynamics, and I'm hard-pressed to find significant studies on invisible materials or practices, except Christianity, of course, such as objects made from organic materials or practices such as pastoralism. Although late antiquity incorporates both the Roman and medieval world as a continuous transformation, it is still subjected to the concept of periodization, working either with a Roman or a medieval set of tools, resulting in the incapability to successfully address less visible periods such as the 5th century. Again, I ask the question, how do we come to this point? Well, why should it be so hard to focus on the 5th century or these in-betweens in general? Well, I believe that all of these issues at their core are related in part to our human nature. Um, things are being difficult to change even if you want to. For instance, take our main topic of the conference, time. Time is both nature and nurture. We know it instinctively and we are taught how to deal with it. How our culture perceives and uses time. And we, in our Western culture, use periodization to deal with time in the long term because as humans, we cannot conceive an infinite and continuous time in a practical way. So to convert an abstract concept um, to everyday life, we compartmentalize it we make little boxes to put a number of factors in and consider that box to be one unit that can be compared to another. In other words, we make a time classification. Uh, and as with all classifications, we have boxes about with things we know much about and boxes uh, we know less about. And the most frustrating of all are always those items that either fit in more than one box or fall on the border of two boxes, as is the case for the fifth century. Oh, sorry, too quick. Uh, while researching time perception, I came across a quote from Gilliland, Halfland, and Ekstrand, 
uh, phrasing something as common knowledge to everyone, if you actually think about it. See here, time estimation depends on the memory of events occurring with any interval. If the interval is filled with many events, it will seem long to recall. If it's uneventful, it will be remembered as short. As Gavin Lucas addressed in his keynote, history serves as the memory of society. For us, this means that the first 250 years of Roman history will appear longer than the last 250 years, simply because much more is known about historical events in the former than the latter, and will be perceived by historians and archaeologists as longer. This indicates that our time classification and periodization is already biased and warped by the time perception from the field of history, while archaeology is not necessarily bound <coughs> to study historical events. And this lies a potential strength to change something. As important as addressing the limits put on us by our very nature is seeking out and addressing our biases. As I have mentioned already a couple of times during this talk for the region of Northern Gaul and Belgium archaeology, there is still a persistence of some long-standing misconceptions. For instance, everyone either believes so strongly that all late Roman settlements were abandoned or that only Germanic immigrants settled here that nobody has ever even bothered to look for Gallo-Roman continuity. And because they don't look, they don't find it. When addressing this matter, one is quickly referred to the lack of Roman material culture. Only some uh, Samian ware from the Argon region remains. Um, there are little to no Mediterranean products are found in the north, stone built villas are gone, the central places disappeared, and so on and so on. So the arguments that there is no Roman population left is that they didn't adhere to the typical Roman package from the first and second century. Although everyone agrees that the Roman world changed in the third century and saw massive reforms with Diocletian and the Tetrarchy, for all, the Constantinian dynasty is not considered less Roman than the Flavians. Yet this change in Roman character has not been translated in search for material culture with which to identify Roman population or influence in Northern Gaul. In general, because the interpretations of the 4th and 5th century are too simplistic, there is a significant lack in nuance in the archaeological record. Like the 4th century town walls are still too often interpreted as defensive structure against Germanic raids, although the chronology and time it costs to erect them does not make sense. Imports and coins are still seen as a measure for in economic inclusiveness in the global Roman economy. Local products and everyday objects are discarded as Germanic because they are not sophisticated enough to match the idea of a rich material culture, hence the absence of it. Yet, as most of you working on the 5th century will know, the absence of evidence does not mean the absence of an active society. I have two more slides. Sorry. So, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that we try to change or challenge our human nature, only to be aware of it and to go look for existing biases and faulty reasoning in our disciplines. And as how to make the invisible visible, it, requir it requires a change in pace. Rather than look at the 5th century with Roman or medieval glasses, we need to develop separate tools to investigate these in-betweens. We need to allow room for invisible options. We have to go crazy and post one as a hypothesis and see if there's even one scenario in which it is possible. I also want to stress that we don't need to be discouraged by a lack of easily identifiable materials. Instead, we need to find a new way to make them identifiable, for instance, by applying prehistoric or anthropological approaches, or invest in detailed studies of well-datable contexts and assemblages, or rely on analysis rather than typologies to characterize and date material culture. So to conclude, from the perspective of late Roman archaeology in Belgium, focused on Northern Gaul, of course, how did we get to an obscure 5th century? On the one hand, we see that there is a continued influence of the decline and fall mental, uh, mentality in which the barbarians are simply used as a, a deus ex machina to explain all without really understanding, and by still pursuing to map ethnicities through material culture. On the other hand, we have the lack of, applic uh, of application of local agencies in the transformation discourse, which still too often seems to focus on elite culture and grand narrative, also making the 5th century invisible. In only a couple of slides, I tried to illustrate that our own human nature and the persistence of biases uh, limits, our, uh, limits us in the present-day archaeology of the 5th century. These two factors are, of course, only part of the story, with more issues obscuring the 5th century from us, such as preservation, to name at least one other major factor. Now, how can we go from here? My suggestion is that we seek out existing biases and address them. Consider invisible options. Develop a whole set of new tools that is neither Roman or medieval, but tailored to the needs of the 5th century. But also, at least for the application on the continent, I want to stress communicating our findings and our suspicions towards commercial archaeology. They have become our main gatherers of data, and as such, it is important to communicate and develop applications that they can integrate, because if they don't find it, we don't know about it. Thank you very much.